بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ہیلو ایوری ون ویلکم ٹو ٹیچر ڈیولپمنٹ ویبینارز مائی نیم زمان اللہ سانگ اینڈ آئی فیسلیٹیڈ ورچوئل پروگرامز ایٹ ٹیچر ڈیولپمنٹ ویبینارز ٹیچر ڈیولپمنٹ ویبینارز ایز اے سوشل ایکشن پروجیکٹ ٹو سپورٹ ٹیچرز اینڈ ایجوکیٹرز اراؤنڈ دی ورلڈ وتھ پروفیشنل ڈیولپمنٹ اپورچونیٹیز ایٹ ایز این انیشیٹو یوزنگ دی رائز ان آن لائن پروفیشنل ڈیولپمنٹ ٹو کنیکٹ پیپل فرام اراؤنڈ دی ورلڈ with opportunities what they may not have had due to the old normal of face-to-face -face conferences. And now it's my privilege to introduce Professor Jabril Diaz Magoli. Dr. Jabril Diaz Magoli is an academic advisor to the Institute of Education at Universidad O.R.T. Juragai, where he also teaches in the graduate programs in education. He has shared his theory and practice with colleagues in the Americas, Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. He has been an active member of and contributor to the work of PSOL International Association and IATFL, for which he was the first Latino president from 2019 to 2023. What a player it is to have you at Teacher Development Webinars, Professor Magoli. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Manila, and it's been it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for um, providing this space to our profession. Uh, and it's really my honor to be able to share with colleagues from so many places in the world uh, some of my ideas about teacher education. So I'm going to start by saying good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, since we have quite a spread of participants from different parts of the world. And my presentation today is on reconceptualizing teacher education. And I'm using a very particular word, the word enabling teacher learning, not promoting, not fostering, but enabling. And you will see throughout my presentation why this idea of making others able uh, is such an important one to me. Most of my work is done uh, teaching and researching and writing uh, my research. And what I'm going to share with you uh, today is the product of almost 20 years of research in the area of teacher education, brought down to uh, a very concrete framework uh, for principal teacher education, uh, both at the pre-service level and the in-service level. And what I'm going to be doing is sharing with you some ideas show you a model of a uh, unit for teacher education using this framework. And I will do so for about 40, 45 minutes, but then I would like to open up the, the microphones for questions and answers. So if you could please do this, keep your questions, write them down on a piece of paper, not, do not write them on the chat because sometimes they get lost. Uh, and then we will have time for question and answer at the end. Uh, and uh, let me thank uh, Manila for the invitation and all of you for attending. So why do I have a problem with teacher education? <clears throat> I come from a part of the world uh, that is considered a developing country. That is a neologism for a poor country <laughs> where teacher education is run by the government. We have a National Teacher Education Council that has 33 campuses around the country. We're a very, very small country, uh, but we have 33 uh, campuses around the country where you can become, you can study to become a teacher at the pre-primary uh, level, primary level, or secondary and technical vocational level. Um, courses are free. Uh, they are paid for by the government. But because we are a public institution, we suffer from the problems of uh, budgeting and all those things. In the case of English language teaching in particular, uh, we are the only degree granting institution in the country. So you cannot get a teaching degree in Uruguay anywhere else but with us. However, there are a group of private language schools that actively create teacher training programs. We are a teacher education council. They are teacher training programs 
where you can do an international certificate in teaching in about a year and a half or two years. Because that is a quicker route, even though it's a paid route, uh, many people choose to become a teacher by doing that. And my feeling, uh, I have also been a national inspector for English as a foreign language. I was director of linguistic policy in my country at the central government level. What I have noticed is that those approaches to teacher training are actually harming the profession. Uh, <clears throat> let me explain why. What I see is that if you want to become a teacher educator in one of those international qualifications, you have to imitate another teacher education who's been doing that, uh, another teacher trainer, sorry, who's been doing that for quite some time. So <clears throat> in that sense, what we are, the what the trainer is doing is replicating a model, a model that has no possibilities for contextual adaptation. So in that sense, to me, this is a geopolitically normative and oppressive kind of training, because who can guarantee that the training techniques uh, given in those courses actually apply to the realities of your context? Additionally, everything about those programs is curriculum centric. It's all about the content, teaching the language, teaching vocabulary, teaching pronunciation, teaching grammar, the language itself, but there's not a pedagogy centric approach. And what does the pedagogy centric approach give us on to, uh, as, an, as an add on to the curriculum centric? A pedagogy centric approach looks at how people learn in a particular context at a particular time in history. So pedagogic, pedagogy centric practices foster solidarity, foster empathy and understanding, whereas curriculum-centered practices do not focus on the people who are actually there to be educated. Because of that, a curriculum-centric, geopolitically normative uh, kind of approach to teacher training is monologic. You tell one story of training and one method of training, which has been replicated regardless of the context. We know, particularly after the pandemic, that what we need is a cacophony of voices. We need to hear what students and teachers in different parts of the world and in our countries, in different parts of the countries of our country, need and can do. <clears throat> there, are, there are authors who have been writing about the McDonaldization of um, of teacher education through these international accreditation programs. And it's true that what those programs tend to focus are what we call methodological nuggets. What are methodological nuggets? Well, there's one way to teach grammar, one way to teach reading, one way to teach listening. So it's everything is about teaching something, but never about teaching the learner. Now, ironically, if you look at the broader field of education, all the moves in education are towards a learner-centric approach. <clears throat> when we talk about student teachers, these are our future colleagues that we are trying to help appropriate the knowledge base of the profession. When we have these monologic, McDonaldized, curriculum-centric practices, we are denying the student teacher's identities as learners. I mean, one is a learner at a time and place in history, and you are learning how to facilitate the learning of others. Uh, but if you are just given recipes of what you should do, and if you don't do exactly that, you are assessed as non-competent, right? Then you are denying the, the, their identities. This perpetuates inequalities. One of the biggest inequalities is precisely the myth of the native speaker. And because these programs were originally intended for native speakers who wanted to teach abroad, <clears throat> they do not take the non-native speaker who was himself or herself a language learner into consideration. So as I said, I'm not going to talk about promoting teacher learning. 
or encouraging teacher learning. I'm going to provide you with tools to enable, to make people able to do a social cultural practice, which we call teaching. So what is it that we need? And by the way, the photos that you will see, these are all my student teachers. I have asked them to take photos and they have uh, consented to me sharing them with you for this presentation. So what is it that we need? Well, we need to look carefully at how we have come to be where we are now. For quite some time now, I've been talking about four traditions in teacher education. Traditions that were born out of different historical needs and different contextual needs, but that somehow coexist in the field nowadays. The first tradition is what I call the look and learn tradition, where you go to training and you get a lot of techniques to do teaching, but it's doing without properly thinking about it. This is the route taken in many initial teacher education courses that are short-term kind of certificate level because the purpose of those programs is that the person who becomes a teacher between inverted commas, in my opinion, can teach one lesson, right? Effectively. But that person is because he's a certificate level, won't be able to do curriculum design or assessment, etc. They are basically technicians. They're not fully teachers. They're technicians who apply rules and regulations that other people give them. As a reaction to this tradition, there is another tradition, which I call the read and learn. <clears throat> Pardon me, but I have, I'm nursing a cold. Our springtime in the Southern Hemisphere is still winter time, um, and we are uh, being affected. This read and learn tradition uh, is what universities have tried to do to counteract the practical nature of training. And they have included a lot of research and, and reading of research. But if you look at the two traditions, they are not very different. Because in both of them, the teacher, the student teacher is expected to replicate something that somebody else has done, not themselves, right? So basically traditions one and two, the look and learn and, and read and learn, focus on discrete aspects and they have ensconced our, our field in a dichotomy, dichotomy, the dichotomy between theory and practice. Luckily during the 1980s, a third tradition was born, uh, which I call the reflect and learn tradition. And this was done through the work of influential thinkers such as Donna Schoen or uh, uh, Fred Court Hagen, where we looked at uh, teaching retrospectively and uh, proactively through reflection. And that is how we learn to teach. This, of course, combine theory and practice for the first time. But the biggest problem that this tradition has is that it's still very monologic. Actually, most of those short-term certificate programs, because they need to do so, incorporated an element of reflective practice. Again, look at my fingers. I'm putting big inverted commas uh, in that reflective practice, <clears throat> which means that uh, student teachers are asked to reflect on the lesson before receiving the feedback, for example, or writing a reflective essay. However, what happens with that reflection is that it benefits nobody but that teacher, uh, teacher uh, student teacher, because this reflection is kept individually, right? So what these three traditions have done is I wrote this in 2012. Uh, the problem with traditions one, two, and three is that because of the reductionist nature, they tend to promote a view of learning to teach that centers on procedures, which are similar to the ones applied in the language classroom. And we know that what we are doing when we are doing teacher education is helping shape the future professional. So for some, years now, I would say for over 30 years now, a fourth tradition has been emerging in the profession, but it has not taken hold yet. And what I'm trying to do is create the turf 
for this fourth perspective, which I call participate and learn, <clears throat> to take hold and become the mainstream. So we go from doing and knowing about teacher or thinking like a teacher to actually becoming a teacher. And this is what the enable framework I'm going to share with you is all about, is allowing student teachers or uh, regular teachers spaces in which they can learn so that they can participate more in a community of practice. We look at the diversity that we have in everything that we do in education. So what we need is a pedagogical model. Remember the pedagogical model that fosters solidarity, this relationship between that person who is learning and the person who is attempting to help them learn. And that model should have certain requirements. It should allow for multiple forms of mediation, not just the input session where I demonstrate what you have to do and then you take notes, you read something and then you imitate me, right? That is one form of mediation, but there are other forms of helping student teachers learn. There's something that we all bring with us, which is called the apprenticeship of observation. That is a concept coined by uh, uh, Lorty in 1975. And what Lorty says is that by the time we get to teacher education, we have, been, we have spent tens of thousands of hours observing good teaching and good learning. And we know what good teaching is and what good learning is like. However, we know it from our experience as a learner. So we don't have access to the, to the teacher's decision-making. <clears throat> and one thing that we know is that this apprenticeship of observation, that previous experience of learning, many times generates a set of beliefs that are very hard to change. That is why many times we find that a student teacher say, yeah, my teacher used to do it like that. I cannot do it any other way because I learned that way. Right. So we need a model that helps us confront the apprenticeship observation, not to destroy it, but to bring it out in the open and see how it relates to what we are trying to teach them. Also, a, a framework or a model that accommodates what we know about teacher learning. There has been a lot of research on teacher learning. And if you excuse me, I'm going to uh, stop my video uh, because I have connection issues says my connection is low. Um, so we know a lot about teacher learning. We know that teacher learning is about, uh, is about becoming a professional in a field, which is a services field that is strongly based on a psychological perspective on learning. And that needs both the column of theory and the column of practice. So we need a model that accommodates both. We also need a model that structures interactions where participants, student teachers, and their teacher of teachers have the possibility to interact, not just in a one-way direction with the uh, teacher of teachers modeling and telling, but also with the student teachers promoting activity, teaching activity. <clears throat> we know that everybody learns in a different way and everybody uh, has different learning needs. So we need a model that provides multiple entry points. What do we mean by entry points? Basically, when we become uh, teachers, we go through a pro process in which first we need to learn to see, to see what teaching and learning look like so that we can notice and learn about that, then we need to do those things and we need to extend our understanding by uh, just doing it. So it's not just doing it, but it's also a process of becoming. So what if we have teachers with different needs? How can we accommodate those needs? We need multiple entry points. And last but not least, we cannot forget that becoming a teacher is a process of self-authorship. The teacher of teachers can give you a lot of uh, ideas, techniques, but it will be you yourself as a student teacher or a teacher under development 
who will eventually generate the learning conditions. So to this avail, I have put here a QR code that has a sample lesson that I taught and I shared with colleagues during the, this year's TESOL conference, <clears throat> pardon me, in the United States in Pittsburgh. I hope you don't take offense that I didn't create a specific handout for this talk, but this was a model that I was asked to share and it's, it's a good lesson that I actually taught. There you can see, you can uh, download it now, don't look at it now, you can read it later, it's very detailed. And you can see the model in action, how to develop one topic. The topic is learning about assessment, right? So that you see that this is not just theory, but this is something that is done in practice. So let's start by looking at what the model entails. I call this the enable model, and each of the letters in the word enable refer to one part of the model or framework. The first part is what I call engaging. Engaging means making student teachers aware of their own experience as learners before we engage them in their own experience as teachers. <clears throat> We answer the question there, how do teachers know, believe, and learn? And we're going to go back to the apprenticeship of observation I've just explained. But for example, if you look at Theriot, um, he says that teacher knowledge is mostly experiential. It doesn't mean that it is practical. It's part of an experience. And when you were a language learner, you had an experience of learning. And that is part of your uh, knowledge. And he says the personal and tacit knowledge, knowledge that we use to make judgments when performing activities depends on how we interpret that activity in light of our previous experiences. So those experiences can favor the learning or stand in the place of learning. So we want to bring them out into the open. Krugs also says that when language teachers, and he includes here researchers, academics, applied linguists, etc., when we put our professional skills into practice, we are engaged in a moral enterprise. And that is very important. We can help or harm our students and society. So we need to look for a way that is safe for our students and our society. And that means coming clean about what we believe language is, teaching is, and learning is, which is to say, disclosing our apprenticeship of observation. Once the apprenticeship of observation has been disclosed, we can move on to providing student teachers the possibility to notice. Notice is becoming aware of how something occurs or is done. In general, we are not aware. So we need to provide the opportunity <clears throat> to raise awareness of the student teachers of there is another way of doing what you had experienced as a learner, right? I follow the work of Mason. He has a wonderful book called The Discipline of Noticing. And uh, what you see here is something I wrote in, in a book which, which has, such, has just come out, published by Rowledge, it's in my bibliography at the end, right? <clears throat> so the, the student teachers have disclosed the apprenticeship observation. They have reflected on their experience, learning to read or learning to write or learning to speak, whatever. Now they need to find the boundaries of what learning to read, learning to write, et cetera, actually means. This awareness raising sets the ground to do two things, to activate the student teacher's background knowledge about the particular topic, which we're going to call core, because they are essential core concepts, core practices, or core dispositions, right? And then after we raise awareness comes the moment when we answer the question, how can student teachers access 
the complexity of teaching, because we know that teaching is a very complex activity that includes metacognitive, cognitive, and affective components. So accessing is the actual teaching, right? Where we go uh, from what um, Kessels and Korthagen uh, quote Aristotle and the difference he made between episteme and phronesis, that is theory with a capital T, the theory that comes from applied linguistics, and also theory with a small case T, that is the one that comes from experience. So student teachers need both episteme and phronesis to be able to access teaching. <clears throat> Cadiero Kaplan talks about the pedagogical literacies that we need to develop as teachers. And she talks about these four levels of school-based literacies. One is functional. You need to be able to do teaching. The other one is cultural. What do we mean when we say that we do task-based learning, for example? Or what model of uh, individual do I advocate for if I am doing project-based learning? Then there's progressive literacy which is listening to the students, allowing them to say, yes, teacher, I'm learning, or no, teacher, I'm not learning. And last but not least, there's this critical literacy, which you subject, through which you subject your own actions to the scrutiny of others and yourself. And you just don't reflect, you critically appraise what you have done. So in accessing, how something is done in teaching. We are tackling the four literacies. As you can see, there is a balance there. So what we want to do is to help student teachers practice the theory that we discuss, but also theorize their practice. That is not an easy thing to do. And we will see how we can do that. To start with, after they have learned about the theoretical uh, let's say the core concepts, core practices, and core dispositions, the moment comes for them to do. They need to do it. Now, if we send them to the language classroom immediately, there is a danger. The danger is that they may harm the students. Remember what Krug said, right, about our moral uh, commitment. So we need to shelter, provide shelter opportunities for student teachers to practice the new concept core concept, practice, or uh, disposition <clears throat> in a safe environment. We call that moment in the framework, the bridging moment, where we bridge the gap between theory and practice. The question we answer here is how can we appropriate contextually relevant practices, practices that are useful for the students that they teach. And, uh, this is basically uh, an elaboration on Hannah Arendt's uh, idea of emerging understandings and webs of relationships. <clears throat> we need to provide what she calls an in-between, right? A moment where students can safely try it out, make mistakes, improve their mistakes with the feedback from others, who are interested others, their peers and their, student, their teacher educator. Basically there, we target the self-access that the students have, their memories and their experiences of learning a language. But also we provide scaffolding where we, the instructors, intervene to make things uh, able to be appropriated by the student teachers. We do collaborative learning where students learn together by doing it together, but also we do reciprocal teaching where students who know more can help students. And as a consequence of the pandemic, we know that there is another form of uh, intervention, which is technology enhanced awareness. There are thousands of resources online and those resources are because most of the times they are not curated. Some are good and some are appalling. Some are very bad. And even the worst examples of things taken from the internet can help the students say, hey, this shouldn't be done, right? Once we have 
done this in a in a safe environment, it's time to move to the actual language classroom and to launch our new understandings. How can student teachers demonstrate that they have appropriated the core concepts, the core practices, or the core dispositions? And we do that through an amalgam of the three, where they practice what they've learned in the teacher education classroom in the language learning classroom. And at all times, there's this issue of solidarity. What I'm doing, my core practice or the core concept or disposition that I put in place, does that show solidarity to my learners? Is that what my learners need, right? This has to do mostly with taking the risk of doing new things in teaching, applying the new learning, and always thinking that this is a tentative application, it's not the final application. And it's a learning moment, it's not a teaching moment. Last but not least, if we want to consolidate the learning, we need to give students the opportunity to explore different ways to extend their new understandings. Remember, this is new learnings, new understandings, and as such, they are tentative. And it's like this, to student teachers, it feels like a big desert that has some doors, good answers behind some doors, no answers behind other doors. So it's allowing the students to take on activities to answer the question, how can we transcend our classroom and really own what we are doing? <clears throat> This is not what would be in other models called the reflective stage. It's more than that, right? It's reflection on action, in action, and through action. And it's not just reflecting, it's reflecting undoing, it's through praxis. So what do we do at this stage? We take stock. We do criticisms of the applications in the launching stage. We do self-assessment, but we also encourage peer assessment. And then immediately after we have done taking stock, self-assessment and peer assessment, we do action planning. We ask the student teachers to commit to changing what needs to be changed in the next class. So we are starting a new cycle again. So as you can see, these are the components of the enable model, right? The theoretical basis for this lies in Vygotsky's idea of um, intermental development. We have here a student teacher and a teacher educator who are exchanging cognitions all the time. As a model, we can take, a, take it apart and we can say there is the engaged moment in the model, which in, uh, has the students connecting with their apprenticeship of observation. How do you do it? You can do stimulated recall, visualizations. Okay, remember when you were a student, how did you do it? You can do it through simulations. You can teach mini lessons, good or bad, and ask students to say how that connects with their own language learning experience. You can use images, you can use videos. Take lesson transcripts, recording, bits of language lessons and then transcribing them. And you can also engage students in keeping journals. Sorry. All these activities to engage. For noticing, here is where we introduce the core practice or core concept and core characteristics. And how do you do that? Well, through classroom tasks activities you do in class with real language learners, through images, through videos, lesson plans that people have constructed, observation forms, the observation checklists completed or blank. You can give journal magazine articles, book chapters or full books on the core practice, core concept and core disposition. And then after they notice, they need to actually deconstruct that noticing, deconstruct how it is done, right? And we do that through those tools, 
videos, lesson plans, lesson transcripts, observation forms, also modeling by the teacher, using scripts. For example, how do you give instructions? First, you call students' attention, then you do this, then you do that. That You write it as a script, and that helps. Uh, and then, of course, all literary sources. All these three moments in the framework are oriented towards helping learners to see the new concept, practice, or disposition that you want them to appropriate, to learn. Then remember we have the bridging and we had the launching. This is a transition period where we teach them to do. First, in the privacy of the training or teacher education classroom, then mediated with real learners in real settings. And last but not least, there is the extending, is the reflecting and assessing on the implementation of the core practices and its associated core concepts and uh, characteristics. And you do that through those things. This learning to see that least learning to do leads to learning to become. And throughout the process, there is mediation, there is intervention by the teacher of teachers, but also by other student teachers, by the students and any other relevant stakeholder, right? And the forms of mediation are the ones that appear there. Now, remember I said we need multiple entry points. Not every teacher needs to learn to see. What happens if your student teachers already have seen, they have noticed and they know about something, but they cannot do it. So you don't need to start with engaging. You need to start with bridging. So design a lesson where the students bridge their knowledge of a topic <clears throat> with the way that you want them to do it. Or what if the students already know about how to do something, they do it, but they cannot yet emphasize whether it's good or bad. Then you go to learning to become. So you can start anywhere at any point in the, in the cycle. The only thing that I recommend is that you follow the next steps and that you complete them all. Because even if you start with extending, right? Because student teachers already know about this. It's good for them to notice how they, it was done when they were students, to notice how it is formally done to access it, bridge and launch. So this is what I call the enable uh, framework for teacher education. And this is based on a series of um, <clears throat> theoretical contributions from uh, the people that you see there in my bibliography. I hope that you have found this an interesting and viable way of uh, teaching uh, future teachers and current teachers. You can use this both for pre-service teaching or for in-service. Uh, you can actually even develop um, a workshop around those principles. So my dear friends, I think, yes, 40 minutes. I took 40 minutes. So we have time for um, questions and answers, which I would really appreciate. Thank you so, so much, uh, Professor Jabril Diaz Magoli uh, for this wonderful talk and sharing uh, your uh, Enable model, our uh, Enable framework. So now the floor is open for questions and answers. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. If you want me to turn a uh, microphone, you can uh, raise the hand and I'll unmute you so you can ask your uh, question from Professor Magoli. I'm just going through the chat, looking at your comments, the comments that you made while I was um, uh, talking. Um, I see the Yulia uh, here makes a point that curriculum often changes in Indonesia. <clears throat> that is why I advocate for a pedagogy-centric approach 
because it doesn't matter what content, what this framework does is provide you with uh, a way to incorporate any content. Uh, we have uh, Abdulaziz who- Yes, Abdulaziz. Abdulaziz, I have unmuted you. You can ask your question now. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Amanullah, and thanks to Dr. Gabriel for this uh, very insightful uh, lecture. Do you hear me? Hello, perfectly, am I being here? Perfectly, Abdulaziz. Oh, okay, perfect. great, thank you. Uh, so I enjoyed the talk all through and I was making a lot of comments just to stay tuned with what you've been saying. Uh, as I, you know, uh, I keep telling my students to keep taking notes of what's happening and uh, that, that helps them with their uh, end of week feedback. Mm -hmm. reflection uh, which they do every week uh, my question to you uh, do you have any specific tips you know on how to help novice teachers get into the business and um, you know um, develop faster in their teaching Please. okay um, are we talking about reflection here or are we no, talking, talking about teacher learning yeah teacher learning I'm talking about novice teacher you have a new teacher has just joined you Mm -hmm. Okay, how to start with them? What tips do you have from your experience, from your link, long experience, mashallah? Uh, mm -hmm. What should we do? First of all, I think you need to provide that new teacher with a mentor, right? Uh -huh. Who's a more experienced colleague to whom they can go uh, to ask questions about things that they don't understand. I would encourage them to do uh, peer coaching. I do yes. peer coaching in three different ways, careful, because peer coaching is not always about ganging up on the teacher and observing their lesson. <clears throat> I use three kinds of peer coaching, one which I call mirror coaching. So I take the new teacher, right, the young teacher or new teacher to my institution, and I say, go and see Mr. or Miss or Mrs. <laughs> such and such. And the only thing that you do when you watch the lesson is write down everything he or she does. Don't make any judgments, just evidence, right? Write down, the teacher goes to the board and writes the day. Then she asks questions to the students. The students answer the question. Just a narrative of that. So basically they are acting as a mirror of the teacher's activity. Then they sit together, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens most of the times is that the teacher who taught the lesson say, hey, I didn't notice I was doing that. Oh, and I did that? When did I do that? Because when you're teaching, you know, right? So that kind of mirror coaching is a good conversation starter. It's not evaluative, right? Then if you have been promoting a particular kind of approach or methodological change in your school, we do collaborative coaching where teachers help each other master the new approach, methodology, technique, whatever, by looking at each other's lessons and giving each other support. If you have teachers who are the opposite of the new teacher, right? You may have a teacher who's very traditional, very set in their ways, right? Who's at the other end of the spectrum. <clears throat> For those teachers, I would recommend something called expert coaching, where one colleague goes and teaches, say, I am the traditional teacher, right? And my students are learning, but not so much. So another colleague comes and demonstrates a lesson for me. They teach my students, right? And then they try to teach in the same way, but first they see it and we talk. These three kinds of coaching are ways in which we are not uh, imposing things on the teachers, new or uh, old, let's say, uh, but we are opening ways for them to become something else. And everything is done in the belief that everybody has learning needs and those learning needs can be taken care of given the right thing. Another thing that I encourage uh, new, new teachers to do is to keep track of their development. I ask them to do weekly reflections. They don't need to be very articulate. 
um, activities that I ask them to do is at the end of every class during two weeks, take a photo of the blackboard. What is on the blackboard at the end of the lesson? And then I can get together with them and they show me the pictures and they tell me what they have taught and how much students have learned. So I hope Andres, uh, that these ideas, I have a few more, but I don't want to hoard the time and there may be other questions. Wonderful. Thanks very much for answering this uh, in so detail. And we have a question from Krishna Dutta from Bangladesh. And she asked, doesn't enabling teachers also means equipping teachers in handling appropriate teaching kits for best outcomes from learners? Um, could you repeat that because you kind of broke down? Yes. So she says, doesn't enabling teachers also mean equipping teachers and handling appropriate teaching kits for best oh, outcomes yeah. for their learners? Yeah, I mean, the whole thing about the enable model is context sensitive pedagogy, looking at what is needed in the here and now. Let me give you an example. In Latin America, uh, Chile, the country, has done enormous progress in bringing English language teaching to the center of educational discussions. And they've had a program for some 20 years now called English Opens Doors. What this program does is it doesn't come from the Ministry of Education. It comes from the Ministry for Economy. So they believe that by giving English a role in society and making the Chilean society bilingual, they will have economic uh, improvements. And what they've done are a lot of crazy but beautiful things. Like for example, immersion camps or uh, debate uh, competitions with students debating in simple terms, in easy English and all those things. It worked very well for Chile. And then some people went to Chile and they said, oh, these are beautiful ideas. So they brought them to Uruguay and wanted to implement them. Guess what? They failed miserably. Why? Because we didn't have the infrastructure to apply those innovations. So that is why I say enabling means looking at what students actually need and how they can best do it. <clears throat> so yes. Great. And yes, uh, you know, context matters and uh, I could relate to this on, uh, uh, you know, personally. Uh, so yeah. And next question from Ravi from India and he says, what factors motivate teachers in advancing their professional learning? and how to sustain teacher motivation? I think the most important thing is for teachers, we know, we know from research that not everybody is a champion of professional development. Not everybody engages in professional development. And we know that those who do it the most are the ones who need it the least, right? They are the good teachers who want to keep on learning. However, if at, at the institutional level, you demand a series of hours be devoted to professional development and teachers are paid for, for those hours, that could be an incentive. I don't really like monetary incentives because to me, they don't yield. But yes, I've seen that, for example, if you pay for teachers to stay over, say two hours a week after school time, and you organize some professional development activities like a research group or a book club, and you provide them with something to drink and something to eat, you show the teachers that they are valued, they tend to stay. And slowly they begin to appropriate this idea that I can develop and become a better teacher. Remember the teacher development is not something we do for the teachers, it's something we do for the learners. We want the learners to have the best teacher possible so that they can have the best success in life. So it, it's, it's, it has to do a lot with teachers' personality and set of beliefs. But I have found that if you open those doors, even paying for one extra hour a week where they don't correct or plan or do administrative work, they just engage in professional development activities. For example, one teacher may have experience experimented with something in their classroom 
and shares it with the rest of the, of the teachers in the school. The principal may come and, uh, I don't know, talk about an article that they have read, share it with the teachers and they can discuss it. These unstructured activities that cater for the different teachers' needs. I think those are good ways of promoting professional development. Wonderful. I see this question from Emily from United States, and she asks, in what way can this framework be used for mid-career and not initial teachers? Uh, as I said, uh, I initially thought of this for pre-service teachers, because that is the reality. I work both at the undergraduate and graduate level. But while I was developing the model at the undergraduate level, I began to see that it could be extended to the postgraduate level. These are teachers who already know how to teach and they're doing uh, masters and doctorates. <clears throat> so I started experimenting with those. That is where, I became convinced that you have to look at where the teacher is at. Say a teacher knows how to do reading comprehension and they do reading comprehension using the pre, while and post method, right? Then they're taking my course on teaching the language skills at the master's level. And the first thing that they discover is that I don't consider the pre, while and post as it's generally done a viable model because reading is a social cultural practice. It depends on the country where you are, how reading is regarded in that country, how much reading is done, and also the context where the students come. If I'm teaching one of the poorest public schools in Uruguay, we have done um, a survey and we know that something like 82% of the students do not even have one book in their house. So, how do I want them? I don't want to teach them to read. I need to develop a context sensitive pedagogy for that. So there is where we go into the bridging, right? We start with accessing for mid-career teachers. Okay, let's think in terms of, let's read widely in the area. Let's watch videos, let's talk to experts. And then let's create something for us, for our context and then try it out and then reflect on it, right? But then I always think it's good that they connect it to their own apprenticeship of observation of the, how they were taught, because when we are in the line of fire, if you wish, when we are there interacting with the students, what surfaces is the way we learn best, not the theory we learn best. Um, of course, uh, some of my colleagues who have tried to, uh, to, to apply the, the framework actually made the comment that they don't need to cover everything. They may skip something, right? Because they found, for example, in one of the cases, this was a postgraduate certificate course. These are people who have a teaching degree and now they are specializing in uh, communicative language teaching. <clears throat> The, the students he had already knew about communicative language teaching, but they didn't know how to do it. So the first thing he did is he went back to showing how communicative language teaching was done, right? And deconstructed the whole thing. So it, they, he went to noticing and from noticing to bridging. He forgot the accessing. And I think that is a good thing for a framework such as this one that is flexible enough that, that it allows users to incorporate their own experiences and their own needs. Great. Uh, maybe this one last question from a uh, uh, great colleague, Ron, uh, Ron Morin, and he says, does this engaged model work across cultural borders? Not all cultures learn the same or accept a certain learning and teaching methods. Exactly. Um, my belief is this, what, this has been uh, piloted in different countries uh, before it actually became something. Actually, this took a long time coming. We started in 2016 
uh, discussing with Anne Burns and Jill Hatfield the possibility of writing a book on initial teacher education that they would edit. And um, I was part of a wonderful team of authors in a series where we read, the model was um, sent to eight international experts on teacher education in different continents. And then I have the richest thing I have in my life is the, the generosity of my colleagues who say, okay, I'll do it and I'll make comments for it. I cannot say for sure that it will be um, the same across cultures. I know, for example, that I tried to implement it in a, in a context which is highly um, structured, to put it some way. And so uh, when we, it came to the uh, becoming part, teachers were not that free to be able to elaborate because they had the constraints of the ministry, the constraints of the syllabus, the constraints of the curriculum, the constraints of the inspector, the constraints of the, of the principal. I know. But at least the um, cognitive processes that engage the teachers can be useful, Ron. I hope that I've answered your question. I mean, it's not an easy question to answer because I cannot say lock, stock and barrel, yes, it will work. But I've seen its limitations. What I value is the way that it promotes mediated learning experiences, right? That takes mediation out of just the trainer or the book and it makes it more social. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And we had the privilege uh, to uh, have uh, both of the authors you mentioned, Professor Anne Burns and Jill Helfield, for a talk at teacher development webinars. And uh, what a pleasure it has been. Uh, so, you know, it has been to have you at teacher development webinars. Really appreciate your generosity and taking time for this talk. And this was long awaited. And, yeah, uh, we've been planning yeah. this for a year almost. <laughs> yeah. So, thanks very much. I really appreciate that and uh, it was great to have you. Thank you all uh, for attending this wonderful talk. The recording of uh, this webinar will be available on Teacher Development Webinars YouTube channel. So please uh, feel free to share with your colleagues. And uh, for the certificate, you can email us at info.tdwebinars at the rate of gmail.com. For our future webinars, please register at www www.tdwebinars.org. We are available on all our social media channels, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and of course, uh, Facebook. Please share your takeaways from this talk using hashtag TDWebinars and uh, take us uh, our hashtag, uh, our Twitter handle is at TDWebinars. So yeah, thanks very much for your participation. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Megoli. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so very much. Have a wonderful rest of the day, evening, afternoon.